Today we're going to be talking about two items, resolving conflicts and also purchasing a house. The first thing in resolving conflicts, we've got a consumer conflict, that's the type of conflict here we're talking about, where you've bought an item and it's not working, or you've cut a deal with a contractor and they seem to be doing something different than what you expected. If you want to be successful in resolving your conflicts, the number one thing you have to be is reasonable. You cannot expect that everything is going to go perfect and life isn't going to intervene. I've had friends who have done things with contractors and the contractor's wife was in like a horrific car accident and then they call the guy screaming that they're not finishing the drywall job. Um, or, hey, I still have open trenches in my backyard for my sprinkler that's not going to work. And sometimes the contractor gets an item like a light or something like that and it's defective. He puts it up, he does an okay job, the light goes out. Well, the contractor needs to come back and fix it, especially if they bought that fixture. When you're telling them on the phone, if you yell, scream, curse, nobody wants to deal with a person like that. The odds of you actually getting what you want are pretty small. So that's one. Number two, you need a plan in place of how you're going to negotiate and how they can resolve your problem. A lot of times people go in and they start complaining and start complaining and someone says, well, what do you want from us? And they go, I don't know, but I'm just mad. Okay, you've communicated you're mad, you're not happy with the situation, but if you do not give them a concrete way to resolve the problem, it's going to be very hard to resolve that problem. Also, one of the tactics that I use in resolving problems, and it works really, really well, is if you've dealt with that company or you've dealt with that store and you like their products, an awful lot of times you walk in, and I've done this at Fry's several times, um, as you go and you're trying to get a refund, Fry's is one of the hardest companies, by the way, to get refunds. It's part of their uh, structure. And so I've got an item that doesn't work. I've got an item that doesn't work the way it was intended to work. Um, it's defective or something like that. And we're in an argument, and they're maybe not going to take it back. And I say, well, you know what? Instead of refunding me the $500, why don't you give me a store credit for $500? Or if I'm at a restaurant, um, a number of times I've gone up to the restaurant and I said, hey, you know what? Normally I've eaten here and your food is fantastic. We eat here two, three times a month. Your carne asada is great. I've had the carne asada steaks before. This time around, this wasn't very good. Now, sometimes they'll say, okay, well, let me take that off your menu, or if they don't seem willing to uh, do that, a lot of times they go, you know what? We spent $25 on this meal. How about you give us a gift card for $25? And we'll come back next time, and then we'll be able to eat again. So you've really gotten your refund. You've gotten what you wanted, but it's in a form that is very easy for the store manager to give you the store manager at Fry's, it's a lot easier for him to issue you a $500 store credit than it is to issue you a check for $500 and take that back. So we want to have a plan. We also want to do a little bit of legal research or talk to someone who knows to see, hey, is the law on our side? Do we have a legal argument? Do we have a moral argument? Do we have a contract violation? Because our approaches to those are going to be different. Do we have a written contract or an oral contract? Oral contracts are just as valid and just as enforceable as a written contract. However, because they're oral, if you end up in front of a judge, you end up with a he said, she said situation, and sometimes it's tough for the judge to figure that out. Now, one of the things, if you can't resolve it, that I've done several times, and it's not very scary, and that's going to small claims court. In small claims court, you don't have Judge Judy up there yelling at you all the time. That's not the way it works. 
The judges are very respectful. Typically, you're giving your side of the case. They give their side of the case. And in my opinion, you need to go in there dressed like you're going to church Easter morning. Um, maybe I shouldn't say that. Some people don't dress great going to church Easter morning. Um, but you should walk in in a suit and tie if you're a guy. You should be in business professional dress if you're a woman. You should have, if you've taken photos, you should have three copies of those photos, one for you, one for the person you're suing, and one for the judge. And a number of times I've come up and they've called me up and maybe I'm going against a contractor and the people in front of me have been yelling, screaming, swearing, cursing at the judge. Um, they've got t-shirts on that say F you or they got all this stuff that's basically offensive to the court. I then walk up and I am dressed appropriately and I say, thank you, Your Honor, for uh, listening to me. And I'll start giving my side of the case. And usually within three or four minutes, they'll interrupt me and they'll say, uh, Mr. Godella, are you an attorney? And I'll say, no. But I just felt it was appropriate that I dress this way out of respect for you and respect for the court. At that point, I have won 90% of the cases. Because what the judge is going to look at me and say Here's a respectful person. Here's a reasonable person. Odds are they try to be reasonable outside of court. And so therefore, they're going to give a lot of merit to what I have to say. Um, if you're unsure about small claims court and you've never been there, you can go down to the courthouse and sit and watch small claims court and see how it goes. See what the judge does. See how people prepare, how people get flustered. The more you know, the less nervous you're going to be. The other thing is that contractors or business owners an awful lot of time will look at you and go, well, I'm not going to do it. If you want, sue me. That business owner does not want to be sued. They've just reached the end of their line and they say, sue me because they know 99% of the people will walk away and they'll never be sued. And so I just look at them and I go, if that's the way you want to resolve it, that's fine. Because I've been to small claims court two or three times. I know what I'm doing. I'm going to pull my kids out of school. We're going to go have a fun day down there. We'll go out to breakfast. It'll be a good experience for them. We'll present the case. Then we'll go to lunch. Um, this is going to be enjoyable for me. Plus, I'm going to subpoena you, so you're going to spend a day in court. Maybe they had two or three other people you dealt with, whether it was the clerk, a salesperson, two or three other people on the construction job. In small claims court, you're allowed to subpoena, so I'm going to subpoena them at the same time. In, in fact, I had a, a horrible experience with a gym once. and got kicked around and kicked around and this and, and some stuff got stolen and they lost other items and I had rented lockers and then they decided they didn't want to do lockers but didn't want to refund my money. Um, I ended up subpoenaing 11 individuals who I dealt with. Before I even walked into court, I knew I was going to win because that business does not want to send 11 people to court to have to give testimony. That's huge losses for them. So before we even went to court, they called me and said, hey, can we resolve this? And I said, yeah, here's what I lost. Here's what I want. Here's the dollar amount that I want. And part of what I wanted was that I knew they could do very cheaply is I want you to extend all of our gym memberships for five years. That's very easy for one of their executives to do. It costs them nothing but was a huge benefit to me. And I ended up getting that done. More than a few times when I made it very clear to a contractor, in fact, one was a plumbing contractor, I had no problem going to small claims court. I would subpoena him and his two contractors and, and his two uh, helpers. Immediately, everything changed. And they say, okay, well, you know, let, let, let's not go to court. H how can we do this? And say, <laughs> you know, we patched over the wall. Your item leaked. I want you to cut into the wall, replace the pipe. 
I want you to fix the drywall and paint this entire room and we're good, which is exactly what I wanted at the beginning and he ended up doing it. So, uh, to cover, one, be reasonable. Unreasonable people tend not to get what they want. Uh, two, have a plan before you go into this this discussion with the business owner or whatever, how you're going to re how you're going to um, resolve it, and how is it going to be resolved to your satisfaction? And certainly, do not be afraid to go to small claims court. Small claims court is not a scary thing at all. In fact, it can be quite fun. All right. Now, what we're going to get into is home buying. Um, we talked the previous chapter about buying a car and about some of that decision process. Buying a house is very, very similar. We're going to spend a lot of time on this, but we go through the same mental process for a car as we go through for a candy bar, for the TV that we talked about last time, for the uh, car, and now we're going to get a house. And we're going to spend more time on this because the cost of failure is so much higher. If you buy a $500,000 house and decide, I should buy a different house, and you're lucky enough to sell the house for the same price, $500,000, the transaction costs, in other words, the sales commissions, escrow fees, moving costs, all of that tend to be about 10% of the purchase price of a house. So if you bought that $500,000 house and then sold it five months later for $500,000, you're still going to take a loss of close to $50,000. And we certainly don't want that to happen. Okay. So our first decision here, looking at uh, slide 7.3, is we want to evaluate some of our alternatives here in renting or buying. First, you want to look at your lifestyle in choosing housing. Maybe you don't want a house. You don't want any of the hassles. You just want to pay your rent, and if something breaks, you call somebody. So maybe you don't want to buy a house. Maybe you do want to buy a house, and you're thinking, I want to live in a condo. For me, I thought condos were fantastic. I loved my condo. I wrote a check every month for 350 bucks for my association fee, handed it to my association, and they mowed the lawns, fixed the sprinklers, put in new flowers, uh, painted when I needed painting, they roofed, they did termites, they sprayed for pests. All that stuff was great. Plus, I knew that if one of the neighbors came up and parked a car on the lawn, and started changing the brakes and left the car out there for a couple days, the association would get rid of it. I also knew that if someone decided to string up their underwear in the front to dry them or sheets or something like that, I knew that that also would be stopped by the association. Some people do not want to live that way. They own their house or they own their condo and they want to paint it the color they want, they want to put the flowers in that they want, they want to leave their trash cans where they want, and, and they just seem to have problems. Those type of people should not buy condos. Condos and townhomes are controlled, what are called, are controlled by what are called CCNRs, um, covenants and restrictions. The covenants and restrictions tell you what you can do and what you can't do within that association. For me personally, I'm not parking my car on the front lawn. I'm not hanging a bunch of uh, um, underwear or sheets out in front trying to dry them. Um, so that's fine with me. It, it doesn't affect me. And I kind of like uniformity. I like a lot of things painted the same color. Works well for me and my personality. Some people want to live in an area like Laguna that every single cottage is different and unique and everybody puts on their own flair to their little house and cottage, that's not a condo, that's not a townhome. So you're better off in that situation buying a house. One of the other things when we're buying a house, one of our considerations, is how much we're gonna spend. Just because 
you can afford to buy an $800,000 house doesn't mean you should go out and buy an $800,000 house. We don't want to end up in a situation where we're house poor. So what we're doing is we're sitting here and we're looking over here at our great house. And our friends ask us, so are you going on vacation? And you go, no, it all going into my house. Uh, you think you're going to get a new car because I, you know, I heard yours broke down? No. It's all going in my house. In fact, what size shoe do you wear? Because I, I can't afford shoes. If you get new shoes, can I have your shoes? Because I have no money. Right? We don't want to do that. That is not a fun situation. We want to certainly buy within our budget. Uh, most of the time, people say you should spend between 25 and 30% of your take-home pay on housing. Here in Southern California, especially when people are just starting out, that tends to be closer to 40% because our housing is so expensive here. And the reason we want to stay within budgets is because part of this personal finance class is that we want to find what works and what makes us happy. Happiness, believe it or not, is driven quite a bit by how well you're doing relative to other people that you interact with. If you take every dime you have and bootstrap yourself into a million dollar house with some negative amortization loan, now you're up in these huge houses and you do, you have a great house. And maybe even you can go on a decent vacation. So you go down to Florida for two weeks and you see Epcot Center, and you see the uh, uh, Space Museum down there, and then you go to talk to your neighbors and say, hey, where did you go on vacation? Oh, you went to Europe for three months, and someone else went helicopter skiing, and another person went on a four-week safari in Africa, and all of a sudden you're going, oh, my vacation sucked, right? If you're in a totally different neighborhood and you're at the higher end socioeconomically, then now I'm in a smaller house. I have more money to spend on vacations. I'm not as nervous of having to make uh, my payment every month because it fits well within my budget. Maybe I went on the same vacation down to Florida. And I go to my friends who are all in the neighborhood and we're out chatting. And I say, well, where did you go on vacation? And one of them says, well, we had fun. We went up to San Francisco. Stayed four days in San Francisco and then stayed two days out in Napa wine country and came back down. Going, okay, that sounds like fun. Mine was better. All right, and so, hey, what did you guys do? And they go, oh, well, we went to San Diego and took the kids to the wild animal park and one day uh, to SeaWorld. And so we were only gone like four days and kind of came back. And so when you look at that, especially when you're dealing with your kids, um, kids are really impacted quite a bit when they're at the bottom of whatever their peer group is. And so are we as adults. Um, and if we tend to be at the top of that socioeconomic group, we tend to feel much happier, even though we had the exact same vacation. It's kind of like if I gave you a Dell computer. It's a three-year-old Dell computer. It runs pretty well, but you know it's three years old, but it functions just fine. Um, nobody else in your class has a computer. You're looking at this going, okay, this is cool. I have a computer and nobody else does. I'm doing really well. Whatever I'm doing is working. I'm able to use this computer and be more effective and you tend to be happier. Now, let's say you have the same Dell computer, but everybody else in the class around you has a MacBook Pro, a $5,000 MacBook Pro Air. And you're looking at that and going, man, all these people have great computers. Mine sucks. What am I doing wrong in life? How come they have great computers and I don't? And that tends to really bring down how happy you are. And you get down on yourself because you look at your peer group and you're much lower. So we want to make sure that we certainly stay within our means. Oops. All right, the next thing you talked about here is renting versus buying. Should I rent or should I buy my house that I'm trying to do here? 
there's certainly advantages and disadvantages to both. The first advantage to renting is it's easy to move. That's by far the easiest. I can just write a note to my landlord, give them 30 day notice and say, here you go, and I'm gonna leave. Maybe you have a lease that comes due in three months or four months, at least usually 60 days before, you should notify them and say, we plan on leaving. Um, no fuss, no muss, no anything. If you own a house and you wanna move, you have all those transaction costs that we talked about before, but also, I have to go out, find a real estate agent, price my house, clean up and stage my house, have open houses and make sure I'm out of the house, um, negotiate price. I need to go out, if I'm gonna buy another house, I'm gonna go do all the, the, the buying process. That is gonna take me six, seven, eight months and an awful lot of work. So if you're trying to decide between renting and buying, one of the things, if you know you're gonna be in an area for under five years, you should rent. If you know you're gonna be in a 10 years or longer, you should buy. If you're in the middle there at six years, five, six, seven years, kind of right on the cusp, then there's a lot of other factors for you individually. Are, are prices tending to go down? Are they tending to go up? Uh, right now, prices in housing are tending to go up, so I would want to tend to be a buyer. If prices were on the slide and going down, then I might stay on the sidelines longer. All right. Um, certainly on renting, we also have fewer responsibilities for maintenance. We don't have to do the maintenance and repair of anything that breaks out of normal wear and tear. If I go to open up my front door, and the knob comes off in my hand, the landlord has to fix that. If I'm really mad at something, I go to kick my dog, I miss my dog, I hit the door, and I break the handle, I have to pay for that. That's my responsibility to do. Also on maintenance that a lot of people don't know when they rent is you are responsible to be a reasonable person and try to mitigate damages that are occurring within your rental unit. So what does that mean? That means if I'm brushing my teeth and I'm at the sink and all of a sudden I look down and there's a bunch of water and I open up the sink and I see that the sink leaks. You have to do what any reasonable person would do. And that would be you get a bucket, you put it under there. If you can turn the water off, you turn the water off. And then you call the landlord and say, hey, the sink is leaking. If you look at that and say, oh, well, I'm busy. I don't want to deal with this. I got to go off to work. And it continues to leak. And it continues to leak. And it ends up ruining the cabinet. And it soaks down into the wood and starts popping tiles off because the wood swells. You're responsible for all that damage because you did not take reasonable care and do what a reasonable person would do. All right, um, some of the other items that we look at here is buying, right? When we look at pride of ownership, right? That's one of the things I actually like about my house. I can say, hey, you know what? This is my house. I love this house. Um, and if someone's in my house that I don't like, I say, get the hell out of my house because it sounds really good. Um, it doesn't sound as good to say, get the hell out of my rental unit. It doesn't, it just doesn't work. So that pride of ownership, being the king or queen of your hassle, ca your castle is really nice. Um, there's an awful lot of financial benefits also to uh, buying a house. Your payment, your mortgage payment is made up of two components. It's made up of the interest you pay on the loan and it's made up of the principal to the loan. So. Let's say that you got a $2,000 payment and $1,600 is interest and $400 is principal. You can write off your taxes the $1,600 per month. So $1,600 per month times 12 is like what, $19,200. Uh, if you have property taxes, that already also gets written off. Let's say it's $5,000. 
So between interest and property taxes, let's say you got $24,000. You can write that off your income. So if you made $100,000, you get to write that $24,000 off so that your income to be taxed is then $76,000. You do not write off dollar for dollar as in if you owe $30,000 in taxes that you get a $24,000 discount in taxes. That's not how it works. You're just not taxed on that $24,000. So if you're taxed at a 30% marginal tax rate on that money, you would take $24,000 times 0.3, which is about $7,000. And so you would end up saving about $7,000 on your taxes. Another great financial benefit is that over time, housing values tend to go up. So if I buy my $500,000 house now, maybe eight, nine years from now, it's going to be worth $800,000. And I might have fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars in transaction costs, but I get to keep the difference between five hundred thousand and the eight hundred thousand less transaction costs. Let's say that that's eighty thousand, so seven twenty. I get to keep that two hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Huge benefit. But I also, it, it, when we talk about um, owning houses short term. If my house payment is $2,000 for a house and I put down, say, 10%, more likely than not, if you rented that same house, it would only be about $1,500 a month. Plus, if you're renting, you're not paying property taxes and you're not paying maintenance. So when you start out, renting is a lot cheaper. But two years from now, your house payment is still $2,000 on your fixed loan and your rent's gone from $1,500 to $1,600 to $1,700. And then a couple years after that, rent is $1,900, then $21, then $23, then $24. And all the time now, you're just paying $2,000 plus you're getting the price appreciation. So long run, owning the house is a heck of a lot better. Okay. So let's look at um, renting and some of the activities that we're going to go through to rent. The items we're going to go here on renting is pretty much the exact same that we're going to go through for buying. Um, the first item it says up here, we want to select an area and we want to search what the rental amounts are going to be or how much we want to pay. So if you're moving into an area, do you want something close enough to walk to college, to walk to work, to ride a bicycle? Do you want to be near hiking trails? You know, all that type of stuff. I had one of my friends that just moved into an apartment a while ago, and he called me and said, oh, you got to come and see this apartment. It's great. It's got this huge gym that's in there that will be fun. It has a great pool. And I looked at him and said, dude, you don't work out. You're, you're never probably going to work out. You'll go down there once. And so a lot of his rent payments are to go to cover a gym so other people can work out. And he hates to swim at the same time. So I'm going, you're not going to be down at this pool. It's a phenomenal pool, but you're going to get to pay some of your rent so other people can enjoy this pool. So when you look at amenities, whether it's a house or whether it's an apartment, make sure that the amenities you're paying for, you're actually going to use. One of the other big items in selecting a, uh, a place and comparing facility to facility you want to go there at night. Places take on a totally different feel at night. You might walk into an apartment complex at 1030 on a Sunday morning and it's quiet. You can hear birds chirping. A little butterfly goes by. This is like the greatest place in the world to raise my family. You then go back at 9.30 at night on a Saturday night just to check it out, what it's like at night. And there is a massive party going on. Everybody's drunk. There's beer bottles everywhere. And then you find out, well, when we were there on Sunday, everybody was hung over, so everybody was in bed. But 80% of all the people that live here attend the university down the street and Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, it's loud and a party fest. 
if you're a college student, maybe that's a fantastic place for you and you want to be there so that, hey, I don't have to drive home. I'm just, I can party and go right home. But if you're raising a family, probably not the first selection. Also, you want to go look at night because let's say you come up to the apartment complex and it's super dark and there's no security lights and it's just, and there's bushes everywhere that people could be hiding in. And you're looking at that and you're going, wow, this just doesn't feel safe. During the day, it's got a different feel. Now, if, if you're a six foot five guy who weighs 240 pounds or a, a woman that's a third degree black belt, maybe that doesn't bother you. But if you're, you know, the average guy or a five foot two, 104 pound woman, that might be a big issue for you. So you certainly want to look into that. Okay. So one of the other things we have down here is we want to verify the lease on, on the section two, verify the lease and the costs. If you're signing to buy a house or to lease something, you're an adult. Adults are responsible to read contracts. Every single year, I have at least one student that comes to me and says, Mr. Godella, I went and I leased this uh, um, apartment or I bought this car and they told me that utilities were included in my rent and then I signed it and the lease says I have to pay utilities so now I'm paying $150 a month in utilities that's not fair can I sue them and I usually look at them and say did you read the lease well no I didn't read it or did you read your auto contract well, no, it was late. I'd been there six, seven hours. I didn't want to read it. You're an adult. You're over 18. You don't have a conservator that's uh, following you because you're incompetent. Then if you sign the lease, you sign the contract, you're going to be responsible for it. All right. The other items are pretty much self-explanatory within your uh, book, and that's all we're going to cover in this chapter. Thank you.